Here's a question for you. Imagine you received an invitation from the Caliph or the Sultan to their palace. What do you think you'll be served for lunch or dinner? Welcome to our latest video where we'll be taking a deep dive into the fascinating world of medieval food and cuisine in the Arab and Islamic world. For centuries, the Arab and Islamic world was a melting pot of diverse cultures, religions and ethnicities. And with them came a wide variety of cooking techniques, ingredients and recipes that continue to inspire chefs and food lovers around the world today. And trust me, there has been quite a few translations on medieval Arab cookbooks, as we'll see later on in the video. In this video, we'll explore the different culinary traditions that flourished in the Arab and Islamic world during the medieval period, specifically for the upper class, the rich, the royals and the caliphs. And I'm going to attempt to cook a medieval Arab dish in this video. So make sure you stay until the end. And by the way, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please make sure you do so. Hit the like button and turn your notification bell on. It helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. Right, our journey begins in the 8th century during the height of the Abbasid dynasty which ruled over a vast empire. Stretching from modern day Iraq to North Africa, during this time, the Abbasids were known for their sophisticated court culture, which included elaborate banquets and feasts featuring a wide variety of dishes. Because the Arab empire was so vast, there was a variety of different dishes and spices from east to west. These feasts placed a high importance on mannerisms and etiquette. It was almost that the most important thing was not what you ate, but how you ate it. You had to make sure you didn't offend guests and often it was a way to boast your extravagance. What also enhanced the ability of the Arabs to invent recipes and become so rich in culinary was their varied and sophisticated irrigation technologies. This allowed them to grow crops such as rice, bananas and mangoes. It cost empires a lot of their budget in order to maintain these sophisticated irrigation technologies but hey, anything for food right? So how do we know what the wealthy classes in the royals used to eat? Well this leads us nicely onto cookbooks and general feasting for the wealthy classes. Most of the cookbooks that have survived are actually tailored to what the rich people used to eat and not so much for the peasants and the general population which makes research in this topic slightly easier. The importance of food for the caliphs and aristocrats led them to write poems and songs about food and they started commissioning new recipes. Historians say that this led to an explosion of Arabic cookbooks from the 10th to the 13th century. Arguably the only cookbooks that were being written in the medieval world were in Arabic. Kitab al-Tabikh is a notable work which emerged in the 10th century and it has over 600 recipes in 132 chapters. Ibn Sayyar al-Warak was the author of this culinary book and it has been translated into English by Nawal Nasrallah. This is the amazing thing. There have been so many medieval Arab cookbooks that are being translated. Another good example is a 13th century Syrian cookbook, Scents and Flavors, which has also been translated. So you can all get your hands on them if you're feeling medieval and want to cook an Arab dish. These cookbooks that were being produced became very popular going into the 13th century, which led to scribes making many copies and selling them. These became popular in the medieval Arab world, one of the most famous ones called Scents and Flavors, as we mentioned earlier. But it's good to mention that in the medieval Middle East, the more spices and ingredients a dish had, the more value it had. It was a way to show prestige but how would a chef pass down this information to the helpers in order to cook these complex dishes? Well, the cookbooks had enough details so that others were able to follow them precisely, even illiterate people. Nine complete cookery books have survived from the medieval times and they have over 4,000 recipes. This just shows how much emphasis was put on writing culinary books in the medieval Arab world which also illustrates the culture and attitude towards food 
at the time. Consequently, it probably had an effect on the Arab world today because the best cuisine you've probably had is an Arab or Mediterranean cuisine, right? However, it would be fair to say that because of the Arab Empire expanding into Spain in the 10th century, it created a new culinary fusion between Arab and Spanish cuisine. Andalusia, in particular, modern day Cordoba, became known for its rich and spicy stews, such as albondigas, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, which is a meatball soup made with a variety of spices and herbs. Another popular dish was the tagine, a type of slow cooked stew that was often made with chicken or lamb, apricots and almonds, as you all probably know. Andalusian cuisine also featured a wide variety of vegetarian dishes. These are still eaten nowadays. And speaking of dishes, one of the most popular dishes in the Arab world during that area was farid, a savoury stew made with meat, vegetables and bread. Farid was often served with dates, which added a touch of sweetness to the dish. Another popular dish was the ma'luba or makluba, a rice based dish that was typically made with chicken or lamb and a variety of vegetables, such as eggplant, tomatoes, and cauliflower, and the list goes on and on. And this is making me very hungry. And to mention a few desserts the Abbasids were also famous for includes halwa, a sweet, Pudding made with sugar, nuts and spices and a taif, a type of stuffed pancake that was often served during Ramadan. Some say its origins were from the Fatimid dynasty. It was mentioned in Sayyar ibn al-Warak's 10th century cookbook, Kitab al-Tabih. A taif are still made today in the holy month of Ramadan, which is just round the corner. So it's something that has survived the centuries. From the cookbooks, you can generally summarize the types of dishes that were written. They included sour stews, usually with vinegar, fruit stews, fried dishes, samosas and pickles. What's quite interesting is that the dishes were named after the main ingredient that was in it. So for example, meat dishes would be called after a fruit that would form its main character. There was a meat dish called tufahiyya, where its ingredient was tufah, apples, another is Laimuniya, its main ingredient being Laimun, lemons. You can now imagine how many dishes were invented with different characteristics which involved a wide range of ingredients. Again, it illustrates the richness of the culinary culture in the medieval Arab world. These cookbooks wouldn't just have instructions on how to cook recipes, but they also tell you about the mannerisms of a chef and how he must conduct himself. You see, this was an art and something the Arabs took pride in. Things like the chef being agreeable, not being difficult to deal with, and having his fingernails trimmed are mentioned. And obviously, as you can see, it's about mannerisms and hygiene. There was an obsession with food for the wealthy, the sultans and the upper classes. These recipes eventually started making their way to Europe. Right, that's enough of me talking and let's get cooking. Right guys, now we've reached the fun part of actually cooking. So I'm in my kitchen now and today we're going to cook a lamb stew known as Romania. This appeared in a royal cookbook in Mesopotamia in about the 13th century. Some say it was actually in cookbooks before that. And Romania is a lamb stew which has pomegranate juice and pomegranates in it. So that's the main characteristic. But we're going to cook this with lamb. And the reason it's lamb is because that was the preferred meat in the medieval Arab and Islamic world, as well as chicken. Beef was actually frowned upon and wasn't recommended because, well, according to prophetic tradition, there's a narration or hadith that says, that came from the Prophet, I believe, and it says about a cow that lahmuhu da wa halibuhu dawa. I'm roughly translating it. So a cow's meat is not good for you, whereas its milk is medicine or a cure. So lamb would be the preferred meat because of this. Let's get cooking.
dressed appropriately for the occasion and this is the final result and what we also have is a dessert we're going to eat I baked these earlier and these are known as Nuhud al Adra, which funnily enough translates to virgin's breasts now <laughs> I don't think I need to explain more about why they're called that <laughs> but yeah anyways I wonder if they cracked jokes in the medieval times about this type of dessert. It could be quite fascinating to know because that will give us a insight into the culture and the sort of banter that was going on. Now when it comes to the etiquette of eating in the medieval times, it's again based on prophetic tradition. You should always have your hands clean and obviously the rich people and the sultans and the caliphs would have their own sort of scented soap which came in the form of ash and you should always eat with your right hand. You should never stuff yourself with food and as much as you can you need to keep quiet on the dinner table and before you start eating you must say bismillah right let's try this now bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim mm. Mm. oh yeah oh yeah this is good The meat is so tender, you could see it's melting like butter and the pomegranate and the pomegranate juice actually gives it this nice kick, like this sort of soury sweet kick, it's, it's, it's so good and what we're going to do is we're actually going to have some bread with that, usually it would be flat bread but I'll just have you know standard Pizza bread, but never mind. We're gonna try this now with the bread. Mmm. Oh yeah. Now this is excellent. I mean, I'm not trying to praise my cooking skills here, but I did an okay job for a first timer. And I could tell why this was served to the sultans and the caliphs because it's exotic full of flavor, the meat is tender, full of nutrients, it's so, so good for you. Right, and before we end the video, let's try our desserts. Mm. Oh, this is good. Because in the recipe, it said that you have to put rose water and you can definitely taste it and the almond flour the raisin on the top it's a perfect combination absolutely delicious well i guess it wasn't too bad of a thing being a a rich guy in a medieval arab world because having food like this you know yeah not much to say really so i'm gonna finish this dish off if you enjoyed the video please make sure you give us a thumbs up subscribe to the channel turn the notification bells on and if you want to know about medieval arab and islamic cooking i would recommend visiting www.eatlikeasultan.com which is the website of professor daniel newman from durham university who's an expert in medieval arab cooking so i highly recommend you visit his website and enjoy